Telecine has been around since the dawn of television in the 1930s, and indeed the Baird Intermediate Film Process used a flying spot Telecine approach as part of its workings. Telecines have developed over the years from the very crude mechanical scanning systems that Baird used through to uh, mechanical optical scanning systems with valve technology and simple electronics by today's standards to the modern post-production tools which have digital processing and advanced servos, multi-gauge capacity and all the uh, necessary devices for modern film and post-production. With the popularity of DVDs and their higher quality reproduction, uh, the opportunity has been taken to remaster many programs which were originally shot on film to the highest quality using machines such as the Philips Spirit, which is quite capable of producing excellent results from intermediates and negatives, bypassing the need to work from old, faded and scratched and marked prints. High definition television is just around the corner and of course content will have to be prepared for this format and again working from the original film elements offers the highest quality reproduction for this outlet. Let's take a closer look at a typical Mark III Telecine machine. This is one of the BBC's ones which has had various modifications made to it over the years to increase its versatility but the basic principles should be the same on any example of this type of machine. A telecine machine consists of various separate but interconnected parts. There's the mechanical transport and the mechanism, there are the optics, the light source, which in this case is a cathode ray tube, which you can probably see flickering against my hand, the photoelectric cells which are hidden out the back, and the various bits of electronics down in the bottom. Now, first thing is to make sure that the machine is clean. The optics, the lenses, uh, the film path and the skids and so forth are all clean of any debris and mess. The gate pulls out for cleaning and access and we have to make sure that the gate skids and the lenses and glasses are clean and free from any debris. This can be wiped off with a tissue or a camel hair brush, making sure that they're not just cause any scratching or indeed a can of compressed air to blow dust out. It's important that the lenses are clean and the condenser lens assembly in the top here is clean. Dust can collect between the two elements in here and cause undesirable effects. This is the 16mm gate block I have here. Now film dirt and debris can collect in various places on here, on the various surfaces of the lenses and the optics, and you can get emulsion build up on the actual skids that the film runs against. They all need to be clean and I find that a fingernail works well to remove emulsion buildup from the skids. Don't use anything sharp or metallic on here because you must not scratch or damage the running surfaces across the gate. The top of the gate is secured by four screws which we undo using an Allen key. It's important to make sure that we don't touch the lens surfaces with our fingers and leave any greasy marks. If we do, use a camel hair brush to shift any dust and a quick puff with compressed air to remove the last of it and carefully reassemble and do up the screws. Of course you must make sure you don't actually touch the lens surfaces with your fingers to avoid any finger marks. When all is done and we're satisfied, close up the condenser and return it to the machine. Having cleaned the gate we now turn our attention to the capstan. We use this cleaning detergent, dilute cleaning detergent on a lint-free cloth, a few squirts, and apply it to the capstan surface, rotating it gently with the finger to remove any loose film debris from the rubber surface of the capstan. While we're here, we can also clean the optical sound heads. We simply unplug and unscrew. This is the 16mm one. Just put it to the side. 
and a 35 millimeter. And we need to check that the photo cells, which run in the grooves on the capstan, are clean. So gently with cotton bud to remove any film dust and debris from the surfaces. And then likewise, the lamp units. Check that there's no debris in the windows. And they simply screw back into position. They locate positively. So there's no need for any alignment or adjustment. So screw back into place and plug in. So the 35 millimeter one. While we're here, we can also check that the combined magnetic sound head is clean. And if there's any stubborn deposits of oxide on there, a little isopropyl alcohol on the cotton bud will help. That's it. Finally, let's check that the cathode ray tube and the mirror are clean from any dust and dirt. Use a camel hairbrush, open the flap, and very gently on the mirror surface to avoid scratching it, dust off any loose particles, and on the tube face inside. Close the hatch. The light output from the cathode ray tube depends upon the beam current, and this is measured in microamps. It's normal BBC practice to run with a beam current of 150 microamps for positive film and prints. Uh, we can go up to 250 microamps when running colour negative and small formats such as standard 8 and 9.5. The beam current is adjusted by these two controls here, coarse and fine. It's important not to go above 250 microamps because that risks burning the phosphor on the tube. The meter normally reads the beam current, but by operating this key, it will switch to read the EHT voltage on the tube. This is normally 25 kilovolts. Excessive EHT voltage can result in the production of X-rays from the cathode ray tube, and this is something to be avoided. A characteristic of cathode ray tubes and phosphors is afterglow, where the phosphor continues to glow for a fraction after the scanning spot has passed over it. On a telecine machine, this gives rise to a streaking effect on the final pictures, and we can track this by using afterglow correctors. There are three units here on the machine, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And they provide a range of corrections with different time constants, which are used to counteract the streaking effect caused by the afterglow. These are adjusted using a special test card and adjusted for minimum visual streaking as seen on the picture monitor. This is one of those uh, adjustments where everything interacts and you can go round and round in circles for quite some time until you get an acceptable result. It's not something that needs to be done every day. Modern cathode ray tubes are a lot more stable than their counterparts of yesteryear, but it is something that needs checking from time to time. Down in this bottom corner of the chassis uh, is a BBC modification to this machine. It's the vertical run amplitude controls. It's part of the zoom control board. Um, and we have two controls, one for all formats except for Super 16 was its original intention, and the switch switches to the second control for Super 16. This is done simply because the gate optics are different between normal formats and Super 16. Different lenses in the gate require different settings. Um, these, these controls will alter the apparent vertical height of the images as seen on the picture monitor. A convenient signal to calibrate the waveform monitor is provided in this case from the Digiscan board. Flicking this switch here gives me a signal of 0.7 of a volt, which I can use to calibrate my scope. Having calibrated the scope, we need to set the white balance on the machine. This is so that the three color channels, red, green, and blue, are giving equal amplitudes with an open gate. We do this with these three controls, which are the master gains for the red, the green, and the blue channels. We set the green channel gain so that an open gate gives us 95% of 0.7 of a volt, 95% amplitude. And we then adjust the red one while looking at the difference between the green and red, and adjust for zero difference, and likewise with the blue channel. And when we've done this, all three channels should be giving equal responses. Right, we've finally aligned the machine, we've checked the white balance, the vision channels, 
the beam current and so on and so forth and everything is clean. So it's now it's time to put some film on. I have a roll of test card here and we'll use this to check the geometry and the focus. My foot on the pedal takes the brakes off to make it easier for lacing. Around the rollers, through the gate, around the capstan and the sound heads. Over the tension arm. And a few times round the take-up spindle. I adjust the tension arms so that they match with the markings on the plate of the machine, so that when I turn on the power, it doesn't snatch too much. There we go. Quick turn to make sure that everything's running correctly. And the first thing to do is to check the gate focus, the optical focus. I do this by looking at the monitor and at the waveform monitor. And I adjust on the waveform monitor, I adjust for maximum amplitude of the high frequency components on the test card. And if we look at the real picture on the monitor, we can see it for best focus. Right, once we're happy that everything is in focus, we can check the geometry of the image. And these are various adjustments down below in the machine. This control here is the focus for the cathode ray tube and is adjusted for maximum HF response, looking at a test card. This control just above it is the horizontal position and moves the image left and right on the screen so that we can get it in the center. This control here, which is a screwdriver tweak, is a vertical position and we adjust that to get the image vertically centered when the film is stationary. This adjustment here, just below it, gives us a height adjustment again when the film is stationary and we've already seen the adjustments for height when the film is running. Finally, this adjustment here, which is another screwdriver adjustment, adjusts the width so that we can get the width of the image correct, again using a test card as a guide. I pointed out to you earlier the controls which affect the height when the film is running, that is a separate operation, so the next thing to do is to set the film running and adjust the run height controls. There it goes, and we can see that the picture height has reduced a little bit, so we adjust the run height amplitude to make it correct. There we are. Now the last thing we do before taking the test card off is check that the optical sound chain is working. Switch to Comopt, Academy filter, which is a five, five and a half kilohertz low pass filter. Play the film and check that the sound level comes off at around zero level. Here we are. Racking control I'm moving now just moves the image vertically up and down the screen and is a purely a mechanical adjustment to allow for different cameras, different printers and so forth. One thing we have to have out of circuit through all of the lineup procedure which we've just performed is the grading controls in lineup mode, out of circuit, so that we're not adding any corrections to the system uh, from the uh, grading adjustments. Likewise, the masking control needs to be set to zero during the lineup process. An essential part of telecine work is grading of the pictures. Why do we need to grade films? Well, the way your eyes and your brain perceive pictures on television are quite, quite different from how you perceive them in the cinema, for example. In the cinema, your attention is all on the screen, you're sitting in the dark, and your eyes and your brain very quickly adapt to the way that the projected picture looks. When you're watching television, you're normally doing it in your living room, there are fixed surroundings, you know the colour of your wallpaper and so on, and the way your eyes and your brain perceive the image is quite, quite different and it's very much more obvious if there are inconsistencies in the colour balance and in the contrast of the pictures. So we have to make adjustments for television to ensure that the pictures as seen on television are acceptable and enjoyable and don't cause any disturbances with the viewers. There's also the issue of artistic interpretation. We can adjust the contrast and the colour balance and so forth to give images, to give scenes a certain look for artistic purposes. Do we want the dark and moody film noir look or bright and sunny for a holiday programme, for example? And then there's the case of rectifying film faults, possibly poor exposure or material which is faded with age and needs to have the colours restored. Uh, and such like, or poor printing, or indeed with home movies, for example, where the original photography may not have been very consistent to begin with.
All of these things can be corrected electronically during the grading process involved in telecine transfers. The grading system we have here is this BBC design system with two joysticks. The left hand joystick mainly affects the colour balance in the shadows and turning the knob on the top mainly affects the, the black level. The right hand joystick mainly affects the colours, colour balance in the highlights and turning the knob on the top alters the peak white. I also have a master saturation control so I can adjust the colour in the scene from slightly boosted all the way to black and white. I have colour lift controls to remove colour casts and a master gamma control which enables me to alter the lightness of the scene if you like, its heaviness or not, to make it light or rather darker and more sinister. It alters the, the uh, law of the contrast of the machine. The positions of all the settings of the controls here can be memorised using DigiGrade, which is a, essentially a memory system which takes a snapshot of the positions of the controls every time it detects a shot change, or I add a cue by pressing a button, and it makes a <coughs> noise every time it detects a shot change. The idea is that we rehearse the film through the whole programme, getting the colours looking right for each scene, the DigiGrade remembers the settings, then we rewind the film back to the top and go for a recording with all the actions that are taking place on cue as they've been pre-programmed during the rehearsal. By moving the scanning patch raster on the cathode ray tube of the telecine, we can effectively zoom into the picture, like so. We can pan left and right, zoom out, go up and down. Very useful for reframing captions, for example, which are a little off-center. And all the zooming controls can be stored on the digigrade in exactly the same way as grading corrections. We can also add the correction for cinemascope films and some blanking, like so. Though this isn't a cinemascope print, you get the idea that we are correcting for the anamorphic distortion, simply by altering the shape of the scanning patch on the telecine. Many films for television have separate magnetic soundtracks, and this is no exception. This is a perfect tone caper mag set mag machine. It handles 16 and 35 millimeter mag tracks, center and edge on 16, and a three track on 35. Simply lace up the mag track with a sync mark on the head in here and put the sync mark in the gate on the telecine behind me, lock the two together and away we go. They keep in step throughout the, uh, the program. We've been looking at the Rank Intel Mark III telecine so far. This is its successor, the Ursa Diamond which benefits from more advanced technology and gives better results, particularly with negatives, and uh, is coupled, in this case, to a Pogel Platinum grading system, which gives greater scope for creative grading control. This particular machine has some bolt-on extras from other companies, in particular the Y-front photo cell box on the front and some circuitry inside, which you can't see, but which is called Twiggy. These are proprietary names for extras for this machine which were developed by a company called ITK and are intended to improve on the performance of the original machine. This is the Philips Spirit Data Cine, the most advanced telecine machine we have here at the BBC. In contrast to the other machines that we've looked at, the Mark III and the Ursa, this one works on a totally different principle. The others were flying spot scanners with cathode ray tubes illuminating the film. This uses an arc lamp and the image sensing is done by three, four even, line array CCD sensors. It's a totally different concept and in fact has more in common with a projector and a camera than the other types of machines, but it is the very latest version of that sort of technology. The Spirit machine was developed by Philips in collaboration with Kodak. Kodak develops the imaging systems and the optics and Philips develops the electronics. It's an entirely digital machine. There are no analog processing in it whatsoever. The signals from the optical pickups are digitized immediately and all the signal processing is done in digital format. This machine can handle 16 and 35 millimeter film and it can be made to work in high definition format as well as in standard definition. The other machines we've looked at only work in standard def. But this will do high def and there are add-on units for it which will enable it to work in data mode as well, if, re if required. This machine is coupled to a Pogel Platinum grading system, like the Ursa, but with some extra bits and pieces on it for the high definition functions. 
and its uh, forte is for remastering use for highest quality transfers and especially with materials involving negatives or intermediates which it is primarily designed for.